SEGA Hello, good evening, and welcome to the latest Total War Warhammer campaign walkthrough video. Today we're putting the feral race of the Beastmen under the spotlight and examining how they play. Now the Call of the Beastmen DLC also comes with its own bespoke mini-campaign, An Eye for an Eye, which focuses on Kazrak the One-Eye's campaign of vengeance against his nemesis Boris Todbringer of Middenheim. With 52 regions and multiple factions to carve your way through, it's a substantial campaign in its own right, and we'll be looking at this in detail via live streams coming soon. But for today, we're focusing solely on the Beastmen and their race mechanics in the context of the Grand Campaign itself. So there are two starting positions for the Beastmen on the Grand Campaign, depending on which legendary lord you choose to play with. Malagor the Dark Omen begins play down here in Blightwater, but we've chosen to play this campaign with Kazrak the One-Eye at the helm, who starts out at war with different factions in Istalia here, which is kind of nice as well as it's not an often visited part of the world. The Beastmen are a Horde faction of course, and we started out with two Hordes in play, though we've already had one wiped out in our war with Istalia, so we're down to Kazrak and his beastly followers. After exacting revenge and smashing Estalia to bits, we move north into the lands of Bretonia, where we've been levelling up Kazrak and improving his Horde infrastructure by raising minor settlements. However, the furtive fiends of Musalon have been taking advantage of our rampant raising and have quickly recolonised many of the ruins, so they're next on the hit list. We've just raised the city of Montfort to the ground, and we're right at the end of the turn here, hence Kazrak being out of action points and all greyed out. But before we end turn, let's recruit a new Beast Lord, as it's high time we started getting a new Horde up to speed. Now you may notice that unlike Chaos Armies, these two Hordes aren't causing each other attrition, even though they're side by side. Now that's because all units in the Beastmen roster enjoy this particular trait, Resilience, which makes them immune to Horde infighting. Now this is kind of a big deal as it really promotes a more cooperative playstyle between your hordes. You'll find yourself using hordes in tandem a lot more often, and it also means you can shadow an established horde with a youngling beast lord, like Armu Doombringer here, who will soak up some XP from the victories and build up those all-important growth points over time, enabling him to kickstart his horde infrastructure when the time comes. Okay, so a bunch of stuff is happening this turn, and this really epitomises the variety and rapid flow of bonuses you'll enjoy in a Beastman campaign. First off, rather like the Greenskins' fightiness meter, Beastmen hordes have a Bestial Rage rating. As they raid and fight, this rises, and when it peaks, a Bray Herd will spawn and join the cause. A fresh, full-fat stack of stinky, hairy Beastmen do bring us to do your bidding. And we've also just completed an objective as we've raised our 8th settlement, netting us a tidy 7,000 favour. Okay, so this is a point of interest. As the Chaos Moon Morsley becomes ascendant in the night sky, Beastmen hordes gather in dark acts of worship, and when this happens, you'll have to direct them in how to do so. Each of these options has a cost and a benefit. So, for example, you may choose an activity that reduces your leadership, if you're not planning on fighting it anytime soon, say, in exchange for increased replenishment to heal your troops back up. Now, the moon travels in a constant cycle, so what this does is adds a sort of rhythmic pulse to your campaign, with a cycle of benefits that, at the right price, can really improve your circumstances. Let's choose an activity, and we'll see the outcome in a turn or two, although, worth noting, we've actually just changed this so that in the final version, you'll get the effect immediately after making your choice in the dilemma. Okay, let's select our Bray Herd, and we're going to send them over to begin sieging Castle Bastogne. And it looks like a lone Bretonian general's hoved into view, which presents an opportunity for our new Beast Lord to pick up some easy XP. And while we're not at war with them right now, Bretonia is definitely on our list of factions to destroy in our objectives. So this seems like a good opportunity to get the party started. We're currently in the right stance for the job, and stances are another aspect in which the Beastmen differ from everybody else. Your standard movement stance is Beastmen Ambush, which gives you a chance of initiating an ambush battle simply by approaching and attacking an enemy. Kazrak also has a unique skill which improves his chances of ambush battles kicking off, reflecting his mastery of guerrilla warfare. Hidden Encampment is your standard encampment stance in that it aids troop replenishment and makes the army immune to attrition. However, it also makes you invisible to nearby forces, and if they draw close they may spot you, but it's a great way to slink into the undergrowth and heal after a big battle. Beastmen can also supplement their income with raiding, and you'll spend a lot of time in the stance, roving from region to region and extracting dark favour as you go. 
And finally, beast men can access the hidden beast paths. Now, like the dwarf and underway, this is a secret network of pathways known only to the beast men. Interceptions and ambush battles are played out in one of a range of new beast path battle maps, which we'll be taking a closer look at later this week. For now, though, let's take a pop at Bretonia, declaring war, of course, before we do so. Both these lords are level one, but as we'd hoped, we've initiated an ambush battle, meaning the balance of power is definitely in our favor. That should make for an easy auto-resolve. Good stuff, and we have just enough action points left to hunt him down and finish the job. All right, let's move on towards Castle Bastogne, where our Bray Herd is headed. Like a Greenskin War Army, they'll be able to support us in battle, or we can simply give them war targets across the map. Now it's clear to see that this part of the world is all a flutter at the moment, as the factions reorganize their forces to face the rampant new threat that we pose. All our early city raising has created a vacuum for Musalon to exploit, which has helped destabilize the area somewhat. And our mere presence here, of course, means that chaos corruption is on the rise too. These gentle, courtly manlings barely know what's hitting them. And here's the result of our full moon dilemma choice. It's risen in earnest and we're getting some hefty unit replenishment, plus a decent population growth buff as well. And the latter will certainly help out our new beast lord. Time to give Bastogne what for now, and if we can beat our Bray Herd to the punch, we'll gain all the benefits of the victory while they stand in support of us. Which it looks like we're going to need as we're woefully outgunned in this battle. Now, we've got a low to mid-tier army composition going on here, consisting of Kazrak himself, plus a handful of axe-wielding gore herds, bow-toting Ungol raiders, who also get vanguard deployment, and my personal favourite units in the Beastmen roster, Minotaurs. These thundering, monstrous infantry barrel along at a great pace, and along with their high mass, they knock packs of smaller units flying. Minotaurs are recruited from the Fire Pit building, and while we're here, let's take a quick look at the entire building tree. Now, the heart of a horde is its encampment building, and as you upgrade it, you'll unlock more growth, recruitment slots, increase the chaos corruption your horde spreads, and of course, add new building slots. Now, as a horde of warmongering chaotic aberrations, the Beastmen have very little use for civic infrastructure, so the majority of their buildings unlock new recruitment options. Up front, we have the Cloven Ones chain, which unlocks Ungors, Gores, and great weapon-wielding Bestigors. The Creatures chain brings varieties of Chaos Warhounds plus Chaos Spawn into play. Centigors are super-fast bestial cavalry and come in three flavors, melee, axe throwers, and great weapons. Razorgors are colossal twisted boar-like beasts which strike hard on their own and even harder when pulling chariots. Minotaurs also come in three flavours, melee, melee shielded, and with great weapons. Now the Minotaur chain also enables recruitment of the Gorbal, the Minotaur hero character. And as a hero, he has a range of new skill types and can be extensively specialised to provide powerful battlefield support functions. Bray Shamans are spellcaster heroes which can be recruited to master the lore of beasts, the lore of death, and the beastman specific lore of the wild. The Saigor is a towering bipedal creature that hurls massive, magically imbued rocks at its enemies. So it's a form of living artillery, and with some riotously powerful combat stats, it's pretty handy in a fight too. And last, but very much not least, Chaos Giants. Onto the support chains now, and the weapons structures bring armor and melee attack bonuses to every unit in the Horde. But it's the Ruination chain that has one of the greatest positive impacts on your Horde composition. Like every faction, the Beastmen have a background income level of 2,500, but they have literally no income-producing structures. So, being able to reduce your unit upkeep by first 25% and later a whopping 50%, you're able to support high-level, high-upkeep units in your horde and stay afloat. Coupled with further upkeep reductions in the Beast Lord skill tree and a steady diet of raiding and raising, there's a finely tuned balance at work here. Even as your net costs rise, they can be managed back down to sensible and even progressive levels, literally as the horde develops. Okay, back to the map, let's crack on with some battering ram production here so we can get through the gates. Now we just have to wait a turn for our Bray Herd to catch up and support us. 
Now, the Beastmen are a rambunctious and chaotic lot, so their hordes will begin to suffer negative penalties to their bestial rage if you engage in collaborative diplomacy. They just don't like making friends. And while that's true even if you get diplomatic with the Warriors of Chaos, there is at least a modicum of dark kinship there. When they enter play mid-game, the Warriors of Chaos are neutral towards you, which beggars the question of whether you want to fight them, keep them on side, or even ally with them as they attempt to set the world alight. Our Bray Herd has caught up with us now, and as you can see, their support means that the siege is now tipped nicely in our favour. With odds like this, we can forego the siege tower construction and auto-resolve for a nice decisive victory. Now as a horde faction, and as you might imagine, the Beastmen don't inhabit settlements. They don't even sack settlements, these goats just want to watch the world burn. But crucially, you get two choices as to how to go about that. Raise and Defile wipes the settlement off the map and erects a blasphemous herdstone in its place. Now this thing drops a bomb of chaos corruption in the province and gives your hordes a hefty growth buff to boot, helping it to develop quicker. However, if you're low on cash, you can simply loot the place silly before hurling the torches at the thatch, thus netting you a juicy pile of income. We're actually moderately well off right now, with over 19,000 favour in our furry pockets, so we're going to go ahead and defile the place. Regions are further corrupted by our forces simply being here, and when that corruption starts to peak, Chaos Rebellions can rise up to attack the local inhabitants. Now, there are other ways in which to enhance Chaos Corruption, not least in the Tech Tree. And like many other aspects of the Beastmen, it's pretty unique. The trees on the left bring numerous enhancements to the combat stats of various units, alongside improvements to various campaign side resources, such as income provision from various activities, attrition and casualty replenishment. However, the more you research, the slower your research rate becomes. After all, Beastmen aren't given to matters academic and easily tire of them. The chain on the right undoes this deceleration over time by boosting the research rate back up again, as well as intensifying the chaos corruption your characters generate. These only take a single turn to research, but rise in cost quite sharply by 5,000 favour per unlock. This means that if you stay buoyant, you can power your way through the tech tree that much quicker. And in a nutshell, that really kind of sums up this new take on Horde gameplay offered by the Beastmen. With no Horde infighting attrition, and with plenty of buffable replenishment through techs and events, they're built to offer a really fluid campaign with less downtime. With Hordes working together on the campaign map, you'll be fighting and raising frequently, and we haven't even started on their capabilities in battle, which offer super-fast, hard-hitting army builds that can wrong-foot, kite, and tear the flanks out of more traditional armies. Fast, furious, and feral to a fault, they are altogether beastly. Tune in again on Thursday this week when we'll be showing the Beastmen doing what they do best in the thick of battle.